Spinning, spinning. There we go. We're recording. There we go. All right. Boom. So, for the tens of people who might see this initially, at least, welcome to the Talking Average Fitness Podcast. Uh, we are Dumb and Dumber, aka. My name is Sam Burns, and I'm joined, as always, by the ever tall and ever ginger, Mr. Kevin McCarthy. <laughs> How are you, sir? <laughs> doing great, man. How are you? I'm doing very well. Thank you so much. Appreciate you being here, and appreciate you. You know, randomly saying, "Hey, we should start a podcast," and and now <laughs> here we are. After after ten thousand ish Instagram rants back and forth, I was like, you know what? I have a lot of thoughts and ideas. Sam clearly has a lot of thoughts and feelings. Let's share our thoughts and feelings to the world, if right? you know, for no other reason, for the enjoyment of our tens of listeners. Absolutely. So we talked about this um, kind of ad nauseum last week uh, in prepping for this. You know. Kind of outlining, first of all, what is Talking Average Fitness, and then why should anybody pay attention to us uh, in particular? Um, and I'd, I'd love to, you know, kind of call some differences between what we normally hear, maybe in the podcast space or in the CrossFit space, in terms of noise or content, and what our intention is uh, with this particular podcast. And, you know, we called it Talking Average Fitness for a reason, and I think you had a really, really great like bead on that. I'd love for you to like tell everybody that. Yeah. So um, kind of in our conversations, both via text message, Instagram calls that we've been on just chatting um, as friends to starting this podcast, we were like a lot of the media and a lot of the, you know, whether it be a podcast, uh, YouTube and anything media regarding fitness and in our case, CrossFit, has really started to be geared towards competitive CrossFit and not just competitive CrossFit, but competitive CrossFit at like an elite level. So for the CrossFit games, things like Wadapalooza, the Dubai, I believe they just changed their name back to the Dubai Fitness Championship. They did. Um, so things like that where, okay, you're following around and kind of getting podcasts and video content and um, things like that about your elite athletes, those top kind of 20, 30 in the world, mm -hmm. CrossFit athletes and kind of what CrossFit looks like for them. Um, and there isn't a massive amount or at least a massive uh, amount of attention placed on what does CrossFit and fitness and health look like for the 99% of the community that aren't elite athletes. Um, so that was something that we wanted to do and we've talked about a lot and I know you and I are both very passionate about it is how can we try and bring a little more attention, a little more awareness, a little more education to what that can look like for your average person versus your elite CrossFit Games athlete? Yeah. So that's kind of where it started and kind of snowballed from there. A ball is a great way to describe this. Yeah. Uh, and I, you know, in, in, in one of our previous conversations, you had this, this great little note that everybody, you know, all of the, the names that we hear, the your Rich Fronings, your Matt Frasers, your Katrins, and your Annies, all of that exists. They get to do what they do. They get to play at the level that they play at because of this thing that was invented for regular people, you know, this thing that was designed for the masses and then you know, kind of spiraled out as, as a live experience, uh, pardon me, a live experiment they realized exactly how far we could push human performance in doing so, you know, and in no way disparaging the, the fact that we have reached that level or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But I love what you said. We can bring, we can provide something, maybe a little bit of clarity, maybe a little bit of refocusing on this miracle that is CrossFit as it applies to average Janes and average Joes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And yeah. so now, you know, maybe most importantly, why the hell would anyone want to listen to us? <laughs> and, and specifically, you know, what gives us um, a leg to stand on in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, it's one thing for us to just rant back and forth on Instagram. It's another thing entirely for us to stand up here and say, you know, we are two coaches. We're professional coaches. We take that very seriously in, you know, not so much like a resume, but, you know, we're here, we're doing this thing. You know, what was your journey to this point, both in terms of fitness and um, CrossFit, your education as a CrossFit coach, 
that's brought you to this point right now where you're standing up and you're saying, we need to focus back on this group of people. Yeah. Um, so for me, fitness, sports, physical activity has been a part of my life since I was, I think I started playing recreational soccer when I was four or five. So since from that point onwards, I always had physical activity, sport in some way, shape or form as part of my kind of everyday life up and, you know, continuously up until now. Um, and so I remember starting to get more into fitness towards like kind of my later years of high school with the goals of trying to play collegiate soccer, professional soccer. And the kind of in my pursuit of that, I was like I need to be fitter, stronger, a better athlete. Um, and I also just enjoyed the work aspect of it. Like I'm, you know, have something I can work at and try and get better at there. Would you when say I that was a to begin with? Like your, your, your appreciation yeah. of hard work and stuff like that came to you naturally? Yeah, I had, I distinctly remember, um, when I was 12 years old, I made my first kind of premier or club soccer team. And later on found out, like I had a suspicion for a while, but kind of found out that the only reason I made that team was because they wanted my dad to coach. It was like a local oh. club team and they wanted my dad to coach. I was not a good soccer player at the time. I was, if there were 18 players mm -hmm. on the team, I was like number 21. There was like three invisible players between me and the rest. And that frustrated me not being one of the good players on the thing. And I remember I, I made friends with this young man named Matt Saunders and mm -hmm. he was a phenomenal player. He had three or four older brothers. So he was a phenomenal player. And I remember thinking, I want to be as good as Matt. Yeah. And so at 12 years old, I would go to my hour, my 90 minute soccer practice. I would come home and I would practice by myself for another 90 minutes to two hours in the backyard. I had my dad build a makeshift goal, like a passing wall. So I can kind of like, you know, receives pass back to myself, um, bought some cones, speed ladders, like the whole thing. I was like, I want to be as good as Matt. So for the next two years, did that whole thing, like an extra two hours or so each day practicing by myself. And then by the time I was 14, was playing starting varsity soccer for my high school. Um, by the time I was a senior in high school, I was voted to the best 11 in the state of Maine, which is where I'm from. Um, so I was one of the named to the top 11 in the state um, for my senior year and ended up playing college semi-pro professional development soccer, the whole thing. Um, so clearly like saw that hard work pay off and I was like, all right, cool. Like if hard work can pay off this way, like I'm going to keep it going. When I went to college, I went to college to study exercise science. Um, so I, in my head, it was like, I want to be a strength and conditioning coach. I want to coach athletes, professional teams, college teams, the whole thing. So I kind of was going that route or that was the goal. Um, and I met another guy also named Kevin who ended up being my roommate in college. Um, and he introduced me to CrossFit and, um, he was very sneaky in the way that he did it. I think we all know the experience of, like you walk into a CrossFit gym and you get like kicked into next week and you're like, what just happened? Um, <laughs> but we liked it for some reason. And so we keep going. Um, right. Kevin was very sneaky in the way he introduced me. He gave me things or like would have me do workouts with him that he knew I'd be really good at. Right. So I start to really like it. So he like basically for a month was like, here's like, just, you know, just like, like little can here you go, here you go like oh i like this i think i'm pretty good at it and then he had one day where he was like here's how not good you are at it yeah. and then the same thing happened i was like i don't like not being good at this so i'm gonna like mm. work really hard at it and kept it going and i remember it's like i want to be a strength and conditioning coach but he's like let's see if you like coaching you should get your level one right so december of 2014 i went and got my level one at the old reebok uh campus in canton oh um, you can't you remember that gym oh, oh yeah. yeah what a what a facility man they had it oh it was such a great gym. Um, but I remember my level one staff was actually Austin Maliolo, yep. uh, Matt Della Valley, yep. and uh, Meg Burns was my level one staff there. Yep. And they were all phenomenal, still phenomenal humans. Yes. Um, and I literally sat there and that level one seminar was life changing for me. It was so incredible for me. I was like, okay, cool. Now I, I want to start getting into coaching CrossFit. So I started getting into coaching CrossFit at a local affiliate um, in Maine. So I'd like coach on school breaks. Yep. Um, and I found that I love this way more than trying to like kind of coaching a high level athlete. 
Yeah. Just like if you have like the football team come in the weight room and strength and conditioning coach, you kind of just like hand them their sheet and they're like, all right, cool. Well, I'm just going to go squat 500 pounds for the second time this week. And you're like, yeah. cool, man. Like I, there wasn't really much to, I was kind of just there and yeah. as fun as programming can be, that wasn't the whole thing that kind of motivated me to get into coaching. And so working with your everyday human, um, you know, your average Joe's and, soccer moms coming in and they just want to be fitter, happier and healthier, like helping them move the needle on their fitness and become healthier human beings and become better. Yeah. Was so much more rewarding for me. And so that's kind of like the path that kind of got me here was started out getting into fitness and and working really hard from to compete in soccer to then like being in college and meeting Kevin and having him introduce me to CrossFit and like just opening up this whole world and avenue of this is what I want to do. And so I've continued kind of down that path, went from level one while I was uh, coaching at that gym in Maine, ended up helping the owner of the gym, essentially kind of assistant head coaching or assistant operating. I don't know how best to phrase it, but I was, I was writing the programming for the gym. I was coaching probably 15 to 20 classes a week. Um, in after college, when I graduated, I had kind of like a little gap year before I moved Mm -hmm. to Boston, coaching 15 to 20 classes a week, writing the programming, helping run the gym and do all the fun stuff there. Mm -hmm. Um, and from there got my level two, just before moving to Boston, got Mm -hmm. humbled again by (laughs) Mr. Mr. Austin Maliolo, always want to humble you. Um, and so got my level two, Realize, okay, I'm not as good at coaching as I thought. Yeah. Drop back 10. Let's kind of, you know, reevaluate things. Got into, luckily got into the coaching staff and, and interning at CrossFit One Nation yeah. um, under James Hobart and Lachlan McGonigal, who, as you know, are two more seminar staff humans. Mm-hmm. Um, and they helped a ton of my development and was like, you know, ever since that level one back in December 20, it was either 13 or 14. You said 14 um, last time. Okay. So there we go. So December, 2014, um, uh, after that level one, I was like, I want to be able to do that for people. I, it was so moving and life changing for me. I want to be able to give that to someone else. So from that day, it was like, I'm on this path. Like I want to seminar staff was the goal. And so being able to learn under James and Lachlan was incredible. Um, we're not quite there yet, but, um, being able to coach with those guys, I then like got my level three, you know, was the head coach of Cross One Nation for, it was probably somewhere between a year and a year and a half, um, somewhere in that range. Um, and so, you know, helped run that gym, gym operations, business side of thing, got to see a little more behind the curtain of running an affiliate in that mm-hmm. capacity after full-time coaching for them for uh, about three years. And then, so now I'm uh, moved a little bit. And so I'm currently coaching full-time at CrossFit Tilt at uh, our Tilt 2 location, which is in Sudbury, Massachusetts. Um, Not the head coach here. We have a phenomenal head coach named Colin, um, but we kind of split responsibility of running the gym and the operations of everything there. So that's kind of been the journey. I've been in the CrossFit space and coaching CrossFit pretty much full-time for the past eight years. Um, So it's been a journey. learned a lot. It's been a ton of fun. Um, sure. so that's kind of the background on how I got into things. What was, uh, what was your journey there, Mr. Sam? Um, not at all the same, uh, <laughs> rad- <laughs> radically different. So, you know, I, I asked you specifically, you know, did you enjoy, you know, mm-hmm. hard work and working, you know, yep. and especially with a background as an athlete and stuff like that? Um, mm-hmm. because I was not that kid. Um, I, uh, you know, growing up, yeah, it, it, I was at that last generation of, not the last generation, hopefully, but like one of the more recent generations of kids where the parents told them to, to go outside and don't come home until the streetlights come on, you know? Yep. So that was as active as I was, you know? And that stayed a thing until I got access to video games. And yep. when I got access to video games, that plummeted pretty quickly. Um, yep. My journey is, you know... My journey is a lot more personal in terms of like motivations and things like that. So I, you know, early in my teens, I was exposed to music, which was wonderful. Um, Mm -hmm. And then like, like right around the same time was exposed to smoking weed. 
which ended up being not so wonderful for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I had these, I had these like divergent paths that I was mm -hmm. trying to walk at the same time. And what that ended up looking like in practice was my, I got out of high school and the thing that I was good at at the time was, was music and, you know, kind of half facetly pursued a potential uh, schooling in music, but then kind of pulled back from that. And I had a gap year and then went to college in upstate New York um, and essentially bombed out of that college because I was far more interested in, you know, drinking and doing drugs than I was anything remotely resembling being responsible. And it, you know, Thankfully, I'm, I've paid off my college loans, so I don't have any of that hanging over my head anymore. But I never should have gone. I, it was yeah. not the place for me to be. Um, and that period of time in college and coming out of that and, you know, basically almost the next 10 years was a, was a slow decline into alcoholism and drug addiction for me. So it, it, it happened you know, in a bunch of different places. I was here in Massachusetts. So I was in the oil and gas industry. Um, and anybody who knows the oil and gas industry knows that when I left college, I just traded one fraternity for another. Um, and it, you know, the age gap was, you know, instead of drinking with people who were my age, there was a 30 year age gap. There was still frat boys. Um, yep. and, and that's not everybody, but that's, you know, certainly a, a subset of people. And, I was here in Massachusetts for a little bit, and then I got an offer to go out to Colorado, and I lived in Colorado for five years, again, trying to do this, this thing, and never should have accepted that job. You know, basically accepted it on ego. I had a, I had a boss of mine. I love him. He, he called me one day. He said, hey, Sam, you do computers, right? And I said, yeah, yeah, I, I do computers. And it was on, <laughs> on that conversation alone that I yep. agreed to go out and become a software developer, which I was not trained for, not qualified yep. for. But my ego led me to thinking that this was a good idea. Yep. It was not. It was a shit show. The five years that I was there was just you know a further descent into drug addiction and alcoholism, um, culminating with me you know, getting let go from that position and on the verge of homelessness and, you know, financially bereft. Um, and thank goodness it didn't get any worse than that. And I found my way into a program and got a little bit of sobriety under my belt. And very quickly thereafter, um, you started asking for help, essentially, which is something that drug addicts and alcoholics are not very good at. And I started asking for help and slowly, year over year, kind of turned my life around. And shortly after I got sober, I moved back to Massachusetts and um, back into a position which was a, a godsend. It was a, an opportunity that allowed me to rebuild my life financially and to, you know, I'd racked up like $24,000 of debt against my parents' mortgage. They'd taken out a second mortgage to help cover my living expenses and debts. And mm -hmm. I got out of that debt and um, was kind of coasting along and just kind of like experiencing life as a newly sober human and figuring out like what was important. And, and then I started, once I got to like the age of 30, I, I started thinking, well, maybe it's important that I kind of take care of myself physically. Um, Cause I had, I had not done that at all as, especially as a drug addict and an alcoholic, a person who was active in drug addiction and alcoholism. And so I, I did, I did the thing that so many people do. I got up at 4 a.m. and I would go to Workout World and I'm, I'm trying to cobble together some kind of fitness, you know, and yep. you, there's so much noise, especially online in terms of, you know, what's effective and what's best. And, you know, I initially was doing some kind of programming uh, from these cats down in Austin, Texas. And to be fair, this is a smart group of cats. They know what they're doing. It's good programming. But I had never had any formal training. And so I'm sitting there in the gym with my headphones on, watching YouTube videos, trying to figure stuff out as I go. And they programmed power cleans. And I have no idea gotcha. what a power clean is. And I'm trying to figure it out and do it with like iron plates on a barbell. 
in a gold's gym essentially oh yeah and, Just and so i dropped that sucker watch the all the stairs kind of oh <laughs> all the was mistakes. this was this uh was this crossfit at this point or was this a different kind of program this was a different program so it's it's definitely you know i know now that it was functional fitness or influenced by something gotcha. like that um yep. but i hadn't found my way to crossfit as a brand at all mm -hmm. um this was about 2016 um and 2016 yeah it was 2016 because i remember seeing the netflix documentary for the 2015 yep. crossfit games yeah yep and watching that and being like how the hell does that work like <laughs> I, I remember calling my parents that's and being the, like, "That's the mystery, right? Like, it's How like does that the Olympics, work? but they do everything and they don't know anything when they show up. It's crazy." Yep. Um, and so I knew that bumper plates were a thing that existed, and if I wanted yep. to learn how to do power cleans, I needed I needed bumper <laughs> plates. <laughs> And it did a bunch well, of research. Nothing and I else, did, just bumper plates. I, yeah, that and I would have been all set for life. <laughs> <laughs> and so I finally settled on. CrossFit Medfield, right? So the yeah. the thing, it was close to where I was, but the thing that made it stood, stand out from a couple other locations was the guy who was running it, and that was Spencer Hendel. So Ooh, handsome. Right? The it's handsome like, you picture, you're like, that's my gym right there. That's right? It was the hair. It was like... Easy, got, easy marketing. Yeah, yeah, it really is easy marketing. <laughs> um, he, I, I, I know now that the reason that I picked it was because, oh, this is the first dude to snatch 300 pounds in CrossFit Games history? Sure, I'll go there. Um, I was so lucky that I showed up at a place where, you know, for those people who don't know Hendel, he was also a multi-year CrossFit seminar staff coach. And to walk into my first exposure to CrossFit with that as the kind of compass or guiding light, I was incredibly yeah. lucky. Um, yep. and then less than a year later, I was at Canton and getting, you know, getting my level one and my, my trainers were Austin, Hendel, Greg, Meg, and, um, Connor. And oh, you had to do it. You had to do a seminar with Greg. Yes. I'm so, I did have sorry. to do a seminar. Yeah. Which, which was <laughs> then so much fun because I did the internship at one nation as well. And anyone who knows Greg yeah. Martino, he's famous for his warm-ups. Oh, man. Um, oh, worst my gosh. Worst so, best warm-ups. I have a few stories of some Greg warm-ups that are incredible. Yes. It's so good. But, well, let's put that off to the side. Oh, yeah. So anyway, so I, I, got, I got to this point of coaching because I, I'm not going to speak for anyone else, but when I was an active drug addict and alcoholic, I... I did not live an honest life. I, you know, there were certainly times where I was sober, but more than anything, I didn't live an honest life. And I left, I lived certainly a selfish life. And I knew that I wanted to live a life of service. And when I made this switch, it's like I was in the oil and gas industry. I was making six figures. I, it would have been easy to stay there and make money. And what I did instead is I, I unplugged myself from that world and i dove into this thing and now i went part-time you know running the on-ramp program at medfield and after that it was you know work up and work up and work up and you know my level two and um eventually my level three and i left medfield as uh, essentially the senior full-time trainer and then i went to um a place called the phoenix where a non-profit organization that supports um, people who are in recovery from substance abuse disorder. It's a fantastic organization, nationwide nonprofit. In yep. Austin, Dorchester, they had a brick and mortar. And um, they wanted a head coach at the time. And so I signed up for that. Um, and then as I was kind of transitioning, uh, we, my wife had just had her first child, our first child, and we were getting used to that. And then we were like, well, maybe we don't want to stay in Boston. We were looking at it shift to Maine. And mm -hmm. so then we recalibrated. I stepped off, I stepped away from that position at the Phoenix. I did a little bit of coaching at the same place. I did my internship at One Nation mm -hmm. in Needham, uh, which was great to come back to at like five years later. Yeah. Um, and now I coach up here in Maine. Um, I do a couple other things like in the CrossFit space, but 
you know, my, my why for being here is um, I had that experience as a, as a regular human in my 30s who found CrossFit and had never been physical, physically fit prior, you know? And it's only been six years that I've been doing CrossFit. Mm -hmm. And in the first year, it was so life-changing that I'm like, okay, this is what I want to do. And so I've been coaching professionally as full-time as possible mm -hmm. for five of those six years. Um, and where I am now and the experiences that I have now, I know for a fact there might be, there might be other than being a good father and a good husband and a member of my community, there might be nothing I do that is so important as spreading this miracle that is CrossFit to as many people as possible so that they get to have the same experience. Yeah. You know? And yeah. that's how I find myself chit chatting with you. Yeah. So I think the like the couple similarities there is, you know, both of us having that moment of I've been given something so incredible that I want to give that back. You know, yeah. for you it's your experience coming into an affiliate and like, wow, this is so life changing. I want to be able to give that to other people. Yeah. You know, for myself getting into the same thing with like the level one is like the level one seminar if you haven't taken it and you have any remote interest, even if you don't take it anyways. Yeah. Um, it's, it's so incredible. The information that you get, even if you have no interest in coaching CrossFit or that being like the path you want to take, yeah. the level one seminar is so incredible and has such amazing information yeah. that I think it's valuable for really any CrossFitter um, or potential CrossFitter to take. Yeah. Um, but it's, you know, I think the similarity there between our two, you know, we both basically coming from opposite sides of the spectrum mm -hmm. in terms of life and the way that our kind of life path was going to then kind of have that really cool connection of like, I've been giving, given something by CrossFit and I want to give that back yeah. to other people and kind of have that being our motivating factors. Pretty cool. And um, luckily, you know, we, even though we didn't quite meet up for our uh, internships at One Nation, I think mm -hmm. it, you know, um, you may have finished yours maybe like a year or so ahead of mine. Um, but that we kind of like both got in with that group of people yeah. in kind of like that, the one nation, the Reebok, the Medfield space where it's, you know, Austin, James, Spencer, Denise, Greg, Meg, mm -hmm. all the phenomenal seminar staff members that we got to learn from yeah. um, that, you know, I'm sure really shaped the way that we view CrossFit now. Um, oh, yeah. Which is, you know, another huge reason of why I want to start the, this podcast. Yeah. So that's, that's cool. And I think it's important to outline that our our journey is not the traditional journey of CrossFit coaches. I mean, no. so first of all, it should be said that for, for like a, a window of a couple of years, and to a certain extent still, but a little bit less so, the Northeast and specifically the Boston area was mm -hmm. lousy with seminar staff members. Mm -hmm. And specifically the Reebok and One Nation, you yep. know, and their extended family um of gyms and you just rattled off a bunch of names yep. all of those people were running in the same space and in the same circles for a couple of years and yep. most coaches don't get the opportunity the good fortune of yeah, just no. running into seminar staff members like outside Every, of everywhere <laughs> yeah like everywhere Every, everywhere didn't you know? matter what gym you went to in boston you're like oh hey here's Right, you know, three seminar staff members. What's up, guys? Right, and so. and that's that's in you know I look back on that now and I'm like, you know, that doesn't happen. Yeah, and, it was, it, that was a really special like kind of stretch of time. Yes, and, incredibly yeah. fortunate. And I think you hit the nail on the head when you said that. You know, I it's it, it is very safe to say that yes, that absolutely shaped what our experience of CrossFit was, how we view CrossFit, both as a, method a methodology and as a practice, how we go about implementing it. Um, you know, there's a, there's a, a guy in the space, his name is Tony Rocky. He talks about the application and implementation of CrossFit, which is really big high level term for the thing that happens when people come into a CrossFit affiliate, which at the highest level, we're talking about saving people's lives. Mm -hmm. that's, that's not an overstatement. And no. depending on who you got exposed to, by dint of good fortune, you might never be, you might have never heard that, you know, you might not realize just how powerful 
you are or you have the opportunity to be as a CrossFit coach and the, the effect that you can have on your community, on the people who are around you day to day. Um, yep. And I know you've experienced that exact same thing at all yep. of the affiliates that you've worked at. Oh, yeah. You, I, you just have to spend like a, a short amount of time inside the walls of an affiliate to, yeah. to see it, to like just to see the impact it has on everyone's life. Yes. The coaches' lives, the because in the same way that we can affect our members' lives, they can also affect ours. You know, it, it is a two-way street. Um, but you just have to spend some time around an affiliate. It doesn't have to be a long period of time, yeah. but just some time inside the walls of an affiliate and and you'll see it. You'll see what it means to the people of that community yeah. if you just kind of like take a second to step back and just observe and look and just see how they interact with each other, see how the class goes, see how like you can just see it. Um, just how much it means to those people, how much it positively impacts their lives um, of people of all walks of life. And that's what I think is, is really cool is there is no, there's no one type of person that's good for CrossFit. CrossFit is for anyone. It yeah. really is. Yeah. No, and there's, and I love, I love what you said. There's of course a famous saying CrossFit is for anyone. It might not mm -hmm. be for everyone. Right. right. And there's, yep. there's an important distinction there. We can talk about that, but it really is. It was a program that was designed for everybody. And one of the things that I think is hilarious, and I had an experience coaching, um, this morning where, yep. um, so the workout was five by three split jerk and nice. that's, that was it. Right. Five oh, by three split jerk. Be beautiful, heavy day. I've yeah. Simple. Love that effective. a lot. And I had a, a wide range of athletes in the class. I had athletes in their 20s who are fire breathers, and they come in five days or more a week, and they're incredibly mm -hmm. fit. And I say that by CrossFit standards. Right? Yep. I have athletes who were in their mid-30s. They are... You know, if you could think of the middle of the bell curve in terms of any democratic, uh, pardon me, demographic sample, they would qualify. Mm -hmm. And I yep. had athletes who, by cross the standards, are considered masters athletes, athletes in their 50s or 60s, who, you know, for some things we might have some um, special considerations or anything like that. But really, what we're talking about is, you know, it, ensuring capability and longevity, right? And for every person in this facility, that's a wide range of capabilities and you know ages and stuff like that, they were all telling stories about their friends who look mm -hmm. at them and say, "Oh, you do CrossFit? You're crazy." Yeah. And yep. There's the there's all of a sudden that big disconnect, and I think it's hard sometimes for people to understand that. Um, I, very, I like to say very often that th there's this preconception that people have to get fit before they come to CrossFit, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we could talk about universal scalability and things like that later, but I like to say that's like thinking that you got to get saved before you go to church. Yep. You know, you come here, we will take care of you. This is where mm -hmm. the fitness is. And yep. nobody walks in with a 500-pound back squat and a five-minute mile. Everybody. Nope. Nope. <laughs> never once nope. happened. So it hasn't <laughs> happened yet. Yeah. And it probably, it probably never will. Almost certainly um, never. Well, just because, you know, to that point is like that, that's having, uh, what was it? Adam Klink is an athlete from CrossFit Krypton. Yep. Um, I, I don't believe he's at Krypton anymore, but uh, he was the first person that I, that I ever saw that actually posted and documented like his journey to what, Greg Glassman had originally described as like kind of like your gold standard for an athlete. If you have 500 pound back squat, a sub five minute mile and 50 unbroken pull-ups yeah. um, in the same day, like, in the same day. Yeah. And Adam did a YouTube. You can, if you Google it or search him on YouTube, I'm sure you can find it, but he did like a few kind of vlogs of his training training for that. Mm -hmm. um, but he just used CrossFit methodology and just like tried to optimize that for him, like the, the training and the programming for him. And he did it. He hit a 500 pound back squat, 50 unbroken pull-ups. And then I believe it was a 456 mile yeah. in the same day. Yeah. And that's just insane to think about. And it's like, but, but you don't start there. Nobody does. Um, you have to kind of build up to that. Um, and, and that is, I mean, Adam is 
an elite level athlete as well. So you got to like kind of keep that in mind. He's not just, you know, your average Joe who's shown up at the gym three times a week. He coached at the gym. He lives in the gym. He, you know, spends a lot of time training, competing at a high level as well. Um, so, but yeah, no one's coming into CrossFit at like this such elite level of fitness. And even if you are, thing is like CrossFit is so unique in the stimulus that it brings and the fitness that it develops and kind of requires of you that even if you're a, you know, what kind of your average people would consider fit yes. when you come into CrossFit, it might not fully carry over. Yeah. You know, if, even if you're like, Hey, I'm a really good runner, but you come into CrossFit, there's still going to be a bit of a learning curve there and a little bit of an adaptation there. Um, just the stimulus of CrossFit is so unique that regardless of kind of what you come into CrossFit with, there is going to be a little bit of that learning curve and adaptation curve. So, you know, everyone that walks in the doors of an affiliate doesn't matter what your background is or what you're coming into it fitness wise with, we're all starting at day one. Yeah. And that's really just it. And that's what I think the cool part is, is, is it really is the great equalizer when you come in first day of CrossFit. It's like, yeah. all right, cool. Like day one of a new journey. That's it. Yeah. So regardless of whether you think, you you know, you don't need to get fit before that, because even if you do build up some amount of fitness, yeah. you, it's still day one as soon as you walk in the door. Yeah. So. And it, you know, talking about the non-physiological side of that, the, the emotional and the neurological side of that, like mm -hmm. the hardest step for almost everybody is the doorstep, right? Yep. Walking mm -hmm. in that door and beginning that journey. And. You know, it might take an, a, an extremely emotionally stable person to walk in and be totally, you know, uh, yep. non-self-conscious. And you just yep. be like, you know, I, I'm totally cool with how I feel experiencing this thing for the first time. That's not yep. most people's experience. There's there's nervousness or trepidation or this fear that, you know, we are going to stand apart from yep. the community. Yep. And second guessing, do I belong? Absolutely. You know, and the whole, the whole nine. Yep. And what we all experience as, you know, I know for me, I walk in and there was a person who was not a coach who came over and introduced themselves. Mm -hmm. And right away, it helped me to start chipping away at those walls that I was putting up or that I had put up on my own. And mm -hmm. just one day at a time coming back and mm -hmm. experiencing CrossFit with mm -hmm. no goals or aims. It so radically changed my life. Um, and it has done for so many people. And I love that you gave the example of Adam Clink. 20 years ago, it was assumed that something like that, five minute mile, 50 pull-ups and a 500 pound back squat in the same day was physically impossible. Yep. You know, it was just not a thing that could be done. Um, mm -hmm. And that particular instance is an expression of, um, you know, the, the far end of the spectrum in terms of human capability and how mm -hmm. far the CrossFit methodology has taken it. And we don't mm -hmm. have to go too far down this rabbit hole, but I do want to touch on this again, that it was never designed to do that. You no. know, cr CrossFit was... We see this epidemic, you know, we, uh, the, cr the creator of CrossFit, Greg Glassman called it the world's most vexing problem mm -hmm. of, um, chronic disease and the interrelated nature of so many chronic diseases. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we, when we go to healthcare providers, the answer is so very often diet and exercise. And <laughs> that's the conclusion of their advice. Yep. Yep. And. But then there's no direction on like, what does that look like or kind of where to go from there? It's like, all right, yeah. you need to focus on your diet and exercise. Yeah. See you next year for your physical type thing. Yeah. Like off you go. Right. Um, and there really is no direction on what that can look like. And, and that's, I think, where that problem kind of stems from. Yes. Um, and uh, to your point of, you know, the method, like the methodology was, was built and created to try and help solve that problem it was never intended to be a high level sport where you see elite level athletes doing these incredible things um, from a fitness standpoint. So 
I think, again, to kind of like bring it back to the point of why we're starting this podcast is like that the cross methodology was built for the 99% of the community that aren't there. The sport only exists because of the methodology and the affiliate and the affiliate model and what everything's doing or what, what's happening at that level. Like the sport wouldn't exist if CrossFit wasn't created just to make people healthier, happier humans. It wasn't the other way around. It wasn't a sport yeah. that then started to kind of like trickle down. I don't know. It, it started at the affiliate level yeah. and with your average humans just coming in, working out, you know, it CrossFit.com work out of the day, mm -hmm. um, going through just from a base and general level, just the CrossFit methodology. And then from there, people started to take it to another level and it eventually evolved into the sport and the spectacle that we know today. Yeah. So, um, but I think that now that we see that sport and spectacle, it's like, Oh, that's what CrossFit is. No, no, no. It still exists down here at this base level. And that's what it always should be. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the spectacle, it's fun to watch, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's fun to see what people can do and you know, the, ev everything that goes with that, mm -hmm. but you can't lose sight of what, crossfit is and was designed to be and what it still is for again the 99 percent of the population so yeah when i you know it, we it's easy for us as coaches to get distracted it's easy for affiliate owners to get distracted it's easy for athletes who walk into the gym to get distracted um i remember when i ran the on-ramp program at medfield my first question one of my favorite questions was tell me what you know about crossfit and invariably, I would say 80% to 90% of the time, there was some mention of, I saw this thing on YouTube. And you know, yeah. depending on which end of YouTube you ended up on, it could be yep. looks incredibly dangerous. Or I saw yep. this person, you know, putting like 400 pounds over his head and and then um, climb a rope and then walk on their hands and yeah, he didn't I, use know, his legs with the rope climb it was <laughs> yeah, he didn't use his legs for anything i don't know <laughs> right um, um go ahead yeah I, I i just remember that the event that i kind of think of is there's is the youtube video of from the 2013 games the cinco one and two um i don't know if you remember do you remember that event but um it was like three rounds of five deadlifts at 405 and then 10 pistols with like 53 pound kettlebell. Yeah. It's like, sure. Why not? And then an 80 foot handstand walk to the finish. Yes. It's like rest 60 seconds, something stupid. And then it was three rounds of like five muscle ups and five deaths at handstand push ups, And then like 185 <laughs> pound axle bar lunge back to the finish. And it's like, if you're watching the last heat, you're like, what in the hell is happening? Like right. that. All right, all these dudes and dudettes look like they were sculpted from marble. Yeah. And they're lifting half a house mm -hmm. and doing these single leg squats. And then they're just walking on their hands. And it's yeah. like that event was a really cool blend of capacities, both from like a weightlifting and gymnastics side. I don't, I don't know about your thoughts, but I thought that was a very well programmed event. And it was cool to watch. But like that's, that is like a well kind of circulated YouTube video of like yeah. watching the final heat of that mm -hmm. at the CrossFit games. And if that's someone's first, if that's what someone thinks CrossFit is, they're like, holy crap. And I, yeah. I feel like that's where the notion of I need to get fit before I do CrossFit comes from mm -hmm. is because they're like, well, I can't do that. It's like, that's cool. Neither can I. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, <laughs> and that's really, really, that's so you important know? to hear is, yeah. you know, I'll, I'll speak for, I'm going to say a lot of coaches, we don't yeah. know how to do everything. We're not, nope. you know, there's a great majority of us as CrossFit coaches. We're not elite level athletes. Um, mm -hmm. We're people who care. We're people who care about helping people on their journey from one place to another. And I, mm -hmm. I love that you bring up that particular event. So that's 2013, right? Yep. We're over 10 years yep. into the CrossFit experiment yep. by the time that makes its, its debut. You know, yep. and, and CrossFit has always been an open source experiment. They yep. we're gonna put something up and we're gonna see what happens and we're gonna engage with the community and we're gonna mm -hmm. tweak things and you know, back when dot com was the only place you could go to for a CrossFit yep. workout. And I mean there are there are people who were born let's say you were born in two thousand two when yep. CrossFit 
was published. First, right? yep, first launched right? main site. Yep. You might have come of age as a teenager during the era of, you know, Katrin David's daughter and Matt Fraser's early wins. And now those people mm -hmm. are, you know, um, in their 20s. Those people who might have discovered CrossFit in their middle teens and then gone hard after it. Now they're 19 or 20. And some of them are fit enough to be at the CrossFit Games. Mm -hmm. and they've never known a world where the CrossFit Games didn't exist. Yep. You know? Yeah, and in you know thinking about like the supreme end of the spectrum, that's a wonderful thing, and I love that. But mm -hmm. there's so much that happens, like there's so much benefit for the ninety nine percent. I include myself in that. Yep. That you know, like you said, it's the reason we're here. It's the reason we're talking about this. Um, we want to make sure we can highlight what happens in the affiliate and what mm -hmm. is happening with this fantastic experiment that is CrossFit um, at the affiliate level. Because mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of fantastic minds and um, who are talking about elite level comp competition and people mm -hmm. who are way more knowledgeable about this stuff than I am. Um, yep. And so I'll, I'm comfortable leaving them to that. I think that, yep. you know, us taking the opportunity to dig into this and hopefully not just with coaches, hopefully with athletes, they mm -hmm. click on this and they get a chance to listen to something that they can identify with. I mean, that would, I would consider a win with yep. this particular endeavor of ours. Yeah. Yeah. I think that'd be, you know, if we can help, whether it be someone who's, you know, the member at the gym, another coach, someone who's thinking about CrossFit, anyone in that kind of realm, kind of just help them understand a bit more about what CrossFit is, why we do what we do, that it isn't just CrossFit as a sport, but that CrossFit as a methodology is so much bigger than that. I think that would be the, the main takeaway. And, you know, to full disclosure, like I, I also really enjoy the competition side. I enjoy talking about it and yeah. looking at, you know, what, what is elite competitive CrossFit looking like and doing, because there is a bit of a trickle down effect. You no, know, as you were saying to, for the CrossFit experiment, you know, that was the whole reason Greg Glassman started posting workouts on CrossFit.com. He's like, let's just put this up here and see what happens. Yeah. Um, and it evolved from being 7,000 pull-ups a week to <laughs> as, as it went down through the workouts evolve as people get fitter. Yeah. Um, but it's like, the, you know, the, the sport does have something to do with that, where it's like, you know, if, if you, you know, 10 years ago, mm -hmm. you wouldn't have 225 or 155 power cleans, like at an affiliate. Yeah. But because the sport has progressed so far, yeah. it's like that trickle down effect does still affect kind of the base level of CrossFit. Yeah. Um, and so they, they, they are tied together, but it's, it's not that, you know, the sport of CrossFit is the end all be all for CrossFit as the methodology. Like, yes, that they, they each influence each other, um, without having like a direct impact on each other, if that kind of makes sense. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's the, the competition side is fun. You know, I, I enjoy competing in CrossFit. I've pushed to a pretty high level of competitive CrossFit, you know, finishing last year, uh, quarterfinals, you know, well within the top 500. So I, but the coaching and the methodology of CrossFit is so much more powerful than CrossFit the competition. At some point, you know, even once I'm done, you know, kind of competing in CrossFit, I'm like, all right, it's time to hang up the shoes and yeah. the whole thing. Like it always comes back to CrossFit as a methodology. And I, it's, it's not like even if when I'm done competing that, yeah. all right, cool, I'm just going to leave the CrossFit community and, and be done because there's nothing else for me. It's like, no, no, no. Right. There's still so much for you in that. And even I would still, you know, I'd bet that even once I'm done competing, coming in, performing CrossFit at its base level of the methodology will still cause me to improve and continue to get fitter as I go, you know, cause that's, the, that's the whole point is yes. a long trajectory to a distant horizon of fitness, yeah. um, which I'm sure we'll talk about 
along the way as well and, and what that means and, and how we go about approaching it. So um, to kind of like sum that up is competitive CrossFit's fun. Mm -hmm. It has a bit of a trickle down effect on the methodology, but it's not the end all be all for the methodology. There's so much more to it. Um, that's incredibly valuable for coaches, you know, members, athletes, and even people that are considering CrossFit alike. So that's, I, th I think it's a really incredible thing and powerful thing that we have the opportunity to talk about. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm excited to be on this journey with you, bud. Ah, I appreciate that. I'm, I'm excited to be here as well. It's going to be fun. Well, and I, and I appreciate the, the kind of nice bow that you, mm -hmm put on that. I think that's a really good place to, to, to stop for now um, and to segue into next week's podcast, which mm -hmm. will be about kind of the state of CrossFit, right? Yep. Uh, we talk about this thing called a methodology, right? What does that mean? Um, when you walk into an affiliate, what might you experience, right? Uh, and if you're a person who does CrossFit already, you will hopefully probably hear some things that you identify with. Um, mm -hmm. But we'll, we'll get into that next week. We talk about the state of CrossFit. Um, between now and then, if you enjoyed this, you know, you, you had some fun, um, <laughs> if this is on a, on an Apple or a Spotify, please leave us a yeah. note, you know, or, or subscribe. And if it's on YouTube, yeah. definitely leave us a comment because oh, yeah. that shit's going to be hilarious. Comments, reviews, the whole thing, Yes, the whole yes. thing, share it with your friends, share it with yeah. people who aren't your friends. Yes. Especially them. The whole thing. Yep. <laughs> Especially them. Get, get them in the doors. Let's go. Yes, absolutely. Let's get it going. All right, so we're going to call it for this week. Thank awesome. you so much. We'll see you next week, my homie. All right, we'll see you next week, bud. Peace, bro. Until then.